Hello, uh, good afternoon, and welcome to DBCon 2022. My name is Kevin McDermott, and I'm with Imperis. And I'm going to give a short, uh, brief introduction to Risk V process of verification, which is a pretty typical topic for DVCon, I think. So um, this is going to be a brief overview. I'm going to give an introduction to the kind of the key aspects around uh, what's going on with Risk V and uh, and verification. And some of the news that we've released here at DBCon uh, this week. Um, obviously, I must apologize for not being with you in person uh, this year. And hopefully this is just coming to the end now of the events and we'll all be back uh, in person in the not too distant future. So I hope you're all safe and uh, please enjoy this short, uh, short presentation. So while we're here at DBCon 2022, we gave a tutorial on Monday, just yesterday, and we went into the deep technical details behind the uh, risk five process of verification. And I'd really encourage anyone that hasn't seen that to go and have a look at that recording. So here we are today at 12.30 on Tuesday, and I'm just gonna give this brief highlights of, of risk five verification. And then I'm gonna hand over at one o'clock to my colleague, Larry, who's gonna talk a bit more detail about the Imperius experiences that are going on uh, right now. So without further ado, let's get going. This is an introduction to the RISC-V processor design verification. So what does this talk about? Really, RISC-V is changing the landscape for uh, SSC designers because now they have this extra degree of freedom to develop pretty much a custom processor to fit the application needs that they, uh, they might need for a certain uh, requirement. And this is like saying you have an architecture license to configure a processor uniquely with the right features and characteristics that's unique for that particular project. Uh, and this is a little bit different to the past uh, SOC um, verification flow, which has been tremendously successful to the point now where we don't actually talk about prototypes as being a prototype any longer. They're just a first silicon implementation. And that was really based on pre-verified high quality processor IP that was bought from one of the mainstream vendors. So the key difference now is with an SOC developer, if you build a custom processor, you're also going to be responsible for the verification uh, effort. And that's the new change that's coming into our industry. And I'll talk to you a little bit about the background of RISC-V and some of the design interests that are going on right now. So just give you a brief introduction to Empiris. We build a range of products and tools around uh, processor simulators. We simulate over 12 uh, ICEs. Um, we have uh, tools and debuggers and the whole modeling technology. We're 14 years old, self-funded, based out of the UK. And our team's experience really comes from a simulation and verification in the EDA, EDA world and processors and embedded systems. Um, some of the staff, uh, like myself, have worked at ARM, MIPS, Imagination, Tensilica, Cadence, Synopsys, uh, and many of the EDA uh, environments. Started working with RISC-V in 2017 and been actively involved in the DV activities since around 2018, 2019. Our focus today at DVCon is to talk about RISC-V process of verification. My colleague Larry, that will follow in the later talk, will talk much more detail about the customer experiences that we have today. So let's go over a brief agenda. I'll talk to you a little bit about RISC-V. Then we'll talk about some of the challenges in the verification and then some of the key components that play into the verification uh, flows. So brief introduction. Um, RISC-V is pronounced RISC-V and this stands for the RISC uh, Reduced Instruction Set Computer. And it was an architecture that was developed out of Berkeley. And it's the fifth architecture that they developed, hence the name uh, RISC-V. But really from that academic roots, this really was envisioned right from the beginning to be a flexible and extendable, extendable architecture, ready for broad mass adoption, well beyond the academics or research projects through into embedded and, and the full production uh, commercial applications. The essence of RISC-V is it's got a base of 45 so instructions, which is a base architecture, and then a modular approach with standard extensions that add uh, vectors, floating point, many other compute arrangements and custom instructions. So that real sort of forward looking architecture to have this uh, evolving uh, freedoms of, of implementations to have many, many different choices was in the inception of the RISC-V ISA to have this adaptability 
uh, built in. And so where we are today, as you can see, going over the last uh, 10 years or so, going from early inceptions of the uh, ISA into early uh, test chips, and then an ISA instruction set architecture is really the, the fundamental uh, definition for almost every system. It defines the software hardware boundary, the software that will run instructions, and then the hardware that will execute those instructions. It's a fundamental technology uh, standard that pretty much drives many of the compute arrangements that we know. So taking those early developments, you can see the software has evolved through RTOSs and firmware and Linux. And then the hardware side has added further extensions, uh, privilege mode, security mode, interrupts, vectors, multi-heart, 64-bit, there's a huge range of activities. And obviously you can't invite a marketing guy to give a presentation without some sort of forward-looking chart. And this is a benefit of the Semico Research Project, which is predicting billions of cores being used by RISC-V. Clearly RISC-V can be used in many configurations and in many roles. It could be as a standalone microcontroller, where it is the only processor in a chip, or it could be as a support role, uh, a minion processor to do housekeeping internal functions for a larger compute operation. It could be heterogeneous with mixed uh, architectures, and it could be used in an array of processors. We've seen a lot of enthusiasm around the AI uh, activities using arrays of processors. So clearly, there's a lot of flexibility and a lot of enthusiasm for RISC-V, and this is reflected in this forward-looking uh, statement. So just to talk about some of the opportunities that are coming up for RISC-V. In some markets, clearly key software and embedded uh, solutions are, are prevalent. But in some of the emerging markets, people are looking at new creative ways or maybe heterogeneous ways to complement the existing solutions with new and advanced capabilities. So pretty much the flexibility of RISC-V is finding a home in almost all uh, markets and applications you can think of. And obviously in some of these slides, they talk about large companies which are investing a lot of resources into bringing RISC-V to reality. So this is an interesting slide. This actually goes back a couple of months. This is from June of last year. And this shows the, the number of members and the number of developments that are really encouraging the ecosystem around RISC-V. It's not just the silicon providers. There's also a lot of software companies and end users that are collaborating around all aspects of RISC-V. And the reason I pulled this one out was really just to show this was the state of play you know, six or nine months ago. And that was ahead of the recent announcements that we've seen from the likes of Intel and others that have really embraced the flexibility of REST5 and are driving quite a large an initiative. So in terms of the technical roadmap, there's many architectures, I won't go over them all in detail here, but things like uh, vector extensions, the uh, DSP SIMD extensions, the bit manipulation, advanced architectural definitions are being added in a modular framework. This gives each individual option, uh, each module, has options and configuration choices within that uh, group of specifications. And then as a collection, they can be mixed and matched to really form a unique uh, combination that's right for a particular processor target, plus, as I mentioned, the, uh, the custom instruction side of it as well. So risk 5 is freedom. And this design freedom is a huge opportunity. As we've seen in almost all markets, in all applications, people are looking for ways and, and, and abilities that are now enabled through, through RISC-V. But this is also a huge challenge. As I mentioned at the beginning, the previous SOC design flows were all based on a, a common assumption of the known good processor IP that was a high quality, high deliverable, very, very capable processors. And that's really driven the last 20 years of SOC verification where you don't test the processor. You might test everything else. You might test the interfaces. You might even run portable stimulus on the processor to test the rest of the system, but you don't test the processor. Now with RISC-V, that shift in the verification responsibility, and it's one of the biggest migrations that we've seen in the history of, of EDA is this sort of change from a few groups doing a lot of detailed work now to every group embracing some aspects of RISC-V verification. So let's talk about some of these verification steps. 
as we know in any design uh, activity, everything you design has to have a test and there is a test implication to every design decision. The difference with a processor is it's already a complex state machine. So if you add more capabilities, as you add more functionality, that complement complexes, adds a complexity to the verification environment. Does it double it? I don't know, but it certainly adds a degree of extra conditions. So every time you look at a processor, you want to optimize the design, but you also want to think about the verification flow. As we've looked at the market, there doesn't seem to be an off the shelf flow to, to cover this. And so we've introduced a new product and we'll talk about that later on uh, in Pyrrhus TV. But if you think about the, the cost and effort for verification today, it's already one of the largest parts of an SSC development. So this is gonna be extra work and, and looking at efficiencies and ways to improve this is pretty much an important activity. So let's talk about um, some of the options here with how you might approach different levels of verification for your project. Um, what I would say is that with uh, any project, um, you've got the RTL running. The first test would be to produce some software that runs some, some code. And as a very first step, just producing a hello world on your new RTL is a good milestone. Um, then you might think about running an RTOS, bringing up an OS. There's a many phases of development. Then you want to look at different torture tests and there's different uh, tests that can be run really just to give you a signature uh, compare. Then you can look at maybe uh, post-processing to look at some log uh, comparison files. Then the latest work we've been doing with the open hardware group is around the log step compare in a synchronous mode, and then the uh, most advanced is on the asynchronous modes. All of this is another degree of freedom of RISC V. You don't have to fully test every core. You know, in some applications, if it's just a test chip or a small uh, proof of concept project, um, it may not be necessary to follow through all the rigor of running through every verification. On the other hand, if it's a high reliability application or it's intended for high volume, then perhaps some of these more advanced flows are gonna be very useful. So let's talk about the first one here. This is the, the Hello World, um, a great achievement, um, taking a paper specification, taking the ISA of RISC-V and build an implementation from scratch is a great achievement. And the first test of an operation is to run some software. The best way to test hardware, as many people would say, is to actually run a program through it. But, just producing an output, or even just uh, booting an OS, um, the uh, verification engineers amongst you will realize you're not fully exercising, you're not completing coverage, you're not really doing a full rigorous test plan. So it's a nice milestone, it's an achievement for the project, but let's move on. You will want to look in most applications at a more rigorous uh, verification flow. So let's talk about the uh, self-checking approach. The self-checking approach is based on having a, a set of programs, uh, test structured, that have a predetermined expected result. When that program runs, it will produce a signature and you can do a comparison that you've achieved that signature. And that meant that that program delivered and the processor uh, behaved as expected and the result was a pass. And that's obviously great if it passes. It doesn't really lend much towards if there is an anomaly or if there is a defect found, it just tells you it didn't run as expected. You, you really doesn't help you on the debug side of things. Um, so that's one way where, where the test is sort of embedded and encapsulated with, with that known signature. Another approach is where perhaps you run um, on the RTL you've just created, and then you also run it on a reference, on a reference model, and then you say, did they both produce the same end result? It's not really rigorous enough to say that you've completely tested the coverage of the processor. Um, it has some drawbacks with the log files, um, some efficiencies. Um, if a discrepancy is found, found you, you may actually run many, many cycles unnecessarily uh, overnight as you continue to run through unnecessary tests. And as I said, on the debug side, uh, just saying there was a failure isn't really good enough to help you uh, trace through and figure out what, uh, what to go and investigate. So those are two good starting points. But now let's move into the, the first level of something that 
it really is getting into the depths of uh, verification. So we're a member of the CHIPS Alliance group. And this is a good flow that was uh, uh, established through the uh, IBEX uh, core. And this is to take the Google open source instruction stream generator. This is a random generator that produces a random sequences of valid instructions. So if you had pure random instructions, you could actually end up with illegal or invalid uh, sequences that were actually not, not terribly useful. What you look for is valid legal sequences but in a random structure to really cover the envelope and stretch uh, the uh, coverage across the processor. That's a pretty good uh, starting point. It's an open source uh, project we've used in many examples. Compile through those instructions and then run the instructions, first of all on the RTL and then run them on the, uh, the software model, uh, our Imperius uh, ISS model. In this case, it says COSIM, but it's not really running uh, COSIM. It's really just running the two tests and then producing a log file. So a log files are great, but they tend to be quite large. Um, and you obviously have to do some sort of comparison. And again, if you notice a difference, at least now you can say where it occurred and how it occurred, but you're not really into a debug mode uh, just yet. So that's a good first order entry level uh, verification. So now let's talk about the next level of uh, lockstep uh, verification. Let's talk about synchronous lockstep. So this is work we've conducted with the old members of the Open Hardware Verification Working Group. And as you can see, it's similar to the earlier steps with the Google Instruction Stream Generator being used to feed into the uh, RTL under test and the Imperius uh, reference model. However, the key part here is it's all included within a system Verilog test bench. And that is a very, very important step. What that means is these simulators, the RTL and the reference model are both running in the same environment. And that's essential to have the synchronization to make sure that you're progressing both through the sequences of instructions in a strict instruction by instruction basis. And then the moment a discrepancy is found, you can immediately dive into the verification and then look at the debug to see what was the sequences that led to that discrepancy and trace back and look at registers. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we did a tutorial yesterday and Lee uh, gave a pretty good introduction of how this works when there is a RTL bug and you see a discrepancy and then how you trace back and look through that. So that is a really solid verification methodology, very, very efficient. You're working directly on the RTL in a debug environment and immediately a discrepancy is found. You're straight into uh, an investigation. However, it does not cover asynchronous events, which leads me on to the next step. So let's talk about asynchronous events. This is a similar flow, but now this has been enhanced to include asynchronous events. Since a processor has many, many states and has a deep, uh, uh, deep complexities, uh, interrupts or debug or other activities will happen during the operation of the processor. So if you couple those effects with the random instruction stream generator, you can cover uh, very complex scenarios and situations where different modes of operations are stress tested with cascading events to really prove that you've validated and verified your, your processor. So that is really the state of the art. And uh, my colleague Larry will cover this in more detail in the talk that follows later uh, here today. So let's just talk about the, uh, the next steps. What, what's, what's the future hold here? Let's talk about some of the standards that we think are going to be important for RISC V. So as I said, this, this flow is, is pretty interesting. We've got an instruction stream generator feeding into an RTO uh, processor. Um, in coupled with running the instruction stream, uh, running the, the model in parallel. So this is a whole test environment. But what this means in reality is all these elements need to interface and work together. You've got the device under test, which is the RTL, that needs to have some trace information and some control registers to allow the step and compare operations to interact with it. The model needs to be fully integrated within system Verilog. It needs to have the configurations to match all the representations of the target test. It needs to have all the comparison operations. It needs to be synchronized. It needs to allow asynchronous events. The functional test bench needs to allow all the functional coverage and the tools to work, plus the debug tools, 
And then you need the directed test, either uh, architectural validation tests, uh, random instruction stream generators, uh, or, or targeted uh, directed tests. So all of these elements could be developed independently. But what we believe is that if every developer doing every RISC five core builds all of these elements from scratch, that would be a little bit inefficient. And so we think there is an opportunity here that we'd like to talk about, which is RVVI, the RISC five verification interface. This is a new open standard that allows these elements to all plug and play together. And by being an open standard, it's free for anybody to adopt. And we pioneered this through the collaboration of the, the uh, other partners and members of the Open Hardware Group. This spec is uh, freely available, and I'll share that link in a moment. But we think at the inception here, as you start to look at how you might tackle a risk five verification project, this is a very good uh, starting point. And interestingly, because it's based around some of the open source cores that are available, even though your particular project might be in the very early stages of the design, you can bring up uh, one of the open source cores as well as sort of like a proof of concept and get to familiar with some of the verification aspects before your own design is actually got to the point of having RTL you can actually test. And that actually gives you a bit of a jump start to get things set up and ready as the design uh, starts to come forward and then you have some real RTL of your own to, to play with. So let's talk about the uh, processor model just for a moment here. Um, we have a full envelope model that covers the full uh, RISC-V ISA, all the standard extensions, uh, some of the new draft extensions that are getting to a stable uh, state, plus the ability to add custom instructions. So that's the full envelope uh, of the complete RISC-V spec. But obviously, no particular chip implements everything. It's un unnecessary. Each, each processor core implements a subset. They choose some of the configurations and some of the standard options. And then within each uh, standard extension, there are many configuration details, um, how you set up and how you choose to use the freedoms that the specification offers you. And so when we model a particular processor, we have this uh, specification worksheet that we look through and it's around 200 questions looking into the detail of which choices were made so we can replicate the exact configuration in the model to match the intended specification of the RTL. And this is just to give you a list of some of the features. Over time, as, as the different specifications matured, we did support some of the earlier draft uh, pre-ratified specifications, and some implementations made use of those. So they are still available as a configuration choice. And then you can see the ratified specs and then further enhancements. So things like the vectors, the bit manipulation, the SIMD uh, DSP extensions, uh, and the latest extensions are all being added into these models, um, um, which used by many of our customers that Larry will, will highlight in more detail later on today. Um, and then also Larry will also talk about how we add custom instructions into our processor model without perturbing the underlying quality of that existing model. So that's quite a neat uh, approach that you can use all of the standard configuration options, but then also add in your own custom instructions. So here we are at uh, DVCon uh, 2022. We've had a couple of announcements this week. Uh, the first one is an architectural validation suite for the new uh, P uh, PMP, it's the uh, physical memory protection, which is uh, a security aspect of RISC-V where under the control of the hardware, you can pre-select dedicated areas of memory that have certain privileges and access rights. So that's a key security measure. These are open choices within the specification. As you build your processor, you will choose certain configuration choices that you want to see implemented in your, your RTL. So having an architectural validation test really helps make sure that those implementation choices behave correctly as you expected. And this is all to do with the software, uh, com uh, uh, software compatibility that we want to have across the RISC-V ecosystem. But it's also useful in some cases to run the expected uh, test that you did not choose, um, just to make sure you didn't leave any vulnerabilities. So that's a new uh, suite we've just announced this week, and that's part of our Imperis DB uh, product line. And then our second announcement, which was actually just this morning, which is on the RVVI, the RISC-V verification interface. 
This is an, uh, an open standard, it's available on GitHub, and it really covers how to couple together the different elements of a test bench and make use of this growing ecosystem around uh, risk five verification. So I'd encourage you to go and look at that press release. It's on our booth here at DVCon, and the specification is on that link uh, over in GitHub. And so really just to, to sort of summarize here, this is a brief highlight. Um, Risk five design freedoms are covering many, many markets, many, many designs are looking at all the flexibilities of risk five. There is a verification responsibility behind that. And I think there is an efficiency that can be gained by collaboration through some of the standards that I've talked about and some of the processes that I've talked about today. We believe RBVI is a great starting point and I'd encourage you to look at the specification as indeed look at the work at the open hardware group and there's a an open source core is a very very good uh, first core, uh, you know, reference point to start looking at um we do have a product and, and, and larry is going to talk about that in more detail in, in the second presentation but what i would say is if this has got you interested in some of the aspects of risk five verification this is just a brief highlight i would encourage you to go back and look at the uh, tutorial we did yesterday yesterday it's it's quite long but the recording you can really look at the the detail and go back and look at that and the slides are available as well we really think that is a good overview of what we think is the the five levels of risk five verification so with that i'd like to say thank you for your time uh, my name is kevin mcdermott my email is kevin m at empiris.com if you have any questions, uh, please contact me through DVCon this week or, or email at any time. And now just to bring you back to the agenda, tutorials I mentioned, I mentioned a couple of times, um, the recorder is available. Uh, go look at that if you haven't seen it yet. I've just covered this brief uh, highlight introduction. And with that, I'd like to now hand over to Larry that will talk in the second half about some more details of our RISC-V verification solutions and some of our customer experiences. So thank you for your time and now over to Larry.